Papermen meet such interesting people. They know the lowdown, now it can be told. I'll tell you quite reliably off the record about some charming people I have known. For I meet politicians and grafters by the score. Killers plain and fancy, it's really quite a bore. Oh, newspapermen meet such interesting people. They wallow in corruption, crime and gore. ting ling ling city desk, pull the press, pull the press. Extra, extra, read all about it, it's a mess meets the test. Oh, newspapermen meet such interesting people. It's wonderful to represent the press. The Media Project is underway, and it is a wonderful event here because we are back in the studio, folks. Welcome to a half hour of commentary and analysis on the media issues of the week. I'm Rex Smith with Alan Shartok, Rosemary Armeo, Judy Patrick. We are the Media Project, and we are here in WAMC Studios. Alan, thank you for bringing us back here. It's wonderful to be here in your fine abode. What? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Alan and our producer, David Gustina, are sitting here sipping their coffees. It's just like the old days, and we're very happy to be here. Rosemary, you doing okay there? I'm doing okay. It's wonderful to see you in person. Judy, you're you're looking like you're tanned, rested, and ready. I am ready. And it, you know what it's nice to see is people's facial expressions. I know the audience yeah. can't see them, but I can enjoy them. So there's yeah. that. Well, there might be a little less interruption because, uh, you know, we'll be able to tell when somebody's taking a breath and about to say something. Exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm likely, the worst right? defender. Oh, I'm the worst well. defender. So yeah, I'm glad to be watching faces. Judy can reach over and slug you if you, you know, get up on here. I'm still talking. <laughs> <laughs> Big news of recent days. We will just lead off with a business story, which is Tribune. Alden Capital, a hedge fund, has become the second largest owner of newspapers. The largest is Gannett, which now has 600 papers or so mm. since it took over uh, whoever it was, Gatehouse Media. And now Alden has bought Tribune. Why this matters is we know about Alden Global Capital and the newspapers they own because that group includes in the capital region Troy and Saratoga papers down in the Hudson Valley, Kingston, and there are a great many papers that they have bought, and their typical stance is to cut down the expenses, let us say. You buy it, and then you stop spending money on it in the same way, and theoretically, you'll be given more profit, right? You get right. more profit. Does that actually work? <laughs> For a short time. For a short time until the whole thing declines. It's very similar. I've made the comparison to privateers in Eastern Europe who would take over formerly state-run operations. You get them for a song because the government doesn't want to run them anymore. And then you just, like, sell off all the assets. You, you bleed the place dry. And it's already happened. Alden has put out the call. I've heard from friends in Chicago and in Baltimore. Put out the call for voluntary buyouts you have until the middle of June. And then after that, it isn't voluntary anymore. So it's already happening. And how do they make money on buyouts, Rosemary? Well, you get rid of the high paid, mostly the most experienced people. Right, right. You bring in either nobody, you just cut the workforce by 20%, 30%, I think was typical of their last acquisition. Or you hire cheap young things who won't give you a complaint when they tell you to do, you know, lousy, easy journalism. And but that's it. Your it, product is declining. It gives you more access to capital. Everything involving this has to do with accounting. I mean, that's right. one of the things in my experience working for a big company. I had a lot of business training, unfortunately. But basically, if you are able to write off your ongoing expenses going forward, it gives you more access to capital because you're reducing reducing your overhead. So you do have the one-time expense, right. but that's considered a restructuring expense, and suddenly you have more money. Yeah, yeah. It should be noted that Alden had to borrow more, a, a lot of money to make all these sales happen, and the payback for all that money is just going to come out of all those newsrooms. Exactly yeah, right. $278 million in debt went onto the books of those old Tribune newspapers, mm -hmm. and so anybody who might want to buy those papers is going to have to be buying debt, too. Things aren't good for newspapers. I've tried to make that point over and over again. I'm reminded of the number one song I used to sing at Camp Bronx House with the kids, which is the Titanic. It was sad when that great ship went down, don't you see? <laughs> <laughs> don't I you think, see? Is that part of the song? Don't you see? And, and, I think, and I think that's part of the problem here, which is this is all compounding the problems that newspapers have in general. 
Yeah, but two points on that, Alan. One, these are still strong news brands. They're still strong news organizations. For example, what's the public radio station in Chicago? W Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. Yeah. Yes, they have to see yeah, my that, point. That one, yeah. Chicago Tribune, you know that name. What's the public yeah. radio station in Baltimore? But the Baltimore Sun. So right. these are strong brands that still are, in most communities, still the dominant news organization in their communities, even though they are much smaller than they were, yeah. much diminished. But I don't think a hedge fund, which after all has only an interest in profit, would be buying these things if they didn't think that they were going to be able to make money on them. Well, yes, as Rosemary so profoundly put it a little while ago, short run versus long, long term. As I have often said, God has term limits, meaning that we're all going to die sooner or later. And therefore, the people who are what me worry, said Alfred E. Newman or Melvin Kosnowski, that's just the way it is, don't you see? Rosemary, you don't look ha- you don't No, look ha- well, it's very sad, and a part of this whole thing was that Alden didn't come in and rob them at gunpoint. The company was sold to them by the current trustees. The sure. only person who voted against it was the CEO. He was promptly fired within, what, minutes of signing other papers. So there is nobody now, except for employees who are stuck working there, because there aren't any other jobs in any other place, who care about the long tradition of newspapers of putting out quality journalism and doing community service. That is not in the equation for Alden whatever. Well, you know, we all bemoan what happens when Alden Capital takes over a string of newspapers, and it is horrible, but we overlook the fact that a third of the nation's newspapers are privately owned, small family operations, and they are doing okay. They are doing quite well. In fact, this negative perception is that the newspaper industry is dying is something that we need to really take a hard look at. We often hear about news deserts, but if you look at really hard at the data, some of the newspapers that that report says have closed actually haven't closed. And so there are newspapers out there who are doing okay. Again, the Alden move is not a good one for newspapers. Those newsrooms will probably be held out, but especially at the local level, I'm seeing newspapers survive. And you work for them, don't you? I do, and we haven't seen a lot of closures of small newspapers in New York State. Judy is, the just for our listeners will know, is the vice president of uh, the New York Press Association, which represents smaller papers typically, right? And let's be clear, there are over 600 of them in New York State. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Now, now, nature abhors a vacuum. And we do know that newspapers are not always cheap things to run, even if you're saving money on them. You have people to pay, reporters to pay, you have printing and all the rest. I work now for, as long as we're talking about who we work for, I work now for a newspaper that is not a newspaper. It's just online, and it doesn't employ a lot of people. And work it being have... a fluid term. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah, work being a fluid term. You're quite right. And uh, one wonders whether, since nature pours a vacuum, whether or not there won't be more of this kind of thing happening, taking the place of the old line newspapers. Or if the brand will survive just as a digital. That's what's happening in a lot of places. You know, even big brands like the Syracuse newspapers, Syracuse puts out a print product, what, two or three days a week now, and is primarily a digital brand. And I think we're all headed in that direction. And there will be news organizations to serve communities. Take note, my alma mater, the Times Union, where I was the editor for 18 years, is now suddenly going deep into the Hudson Valley. You'll hear the underwriting here on WAMC announcing, you know, from Putnam County all the way up through Columbia and Greene counties. That is a new initiative that, by the way, the Times Union is investing in. They've actually hired reporters and editors to cover that area. And they're giving us at WAMC a lot of underwriting so money. wonder if I just said that, yes. Thank you. No, you did say it. I did. I, but I yeah. thought it was worth Worth emphasizing. <laughs> in Thank you. <laughs> I, I feel like we're misleading people, though, again. And I saw this from again. the 1990s on when newspapers began receding, which is like, oh, yeah, we're smaller. Our papers are smaller now, but it's better news. We're giving you more for less. And then we have fewer reporters now, but we're, we're working more efficiently. And now it's like, well, the big newspapers are all folding, but their little ones are all surviving. Newspapers are not as good as they once were. There is nothing that compares to what we had. There's no replacement. Look at the journalism schools. We are not getting the quality of students that we used to in the 70s and 80s. We are not. 
We simply are not. And it is not a field that's attracting the best and the brightest anymore. Journalism is in trouble because newspapers are in trouble. And all this brightness and light, very nice, yay, yay, but it's not the real picture. I wish I could say I disagree with you, but I agree with every word you just said. <laughs> there was a time in Rosemary's career, just so we're identifying this, when she ran an organization called Investigative Reporters and Editors, uh, which is the national organization that actually sponsors the most impressive contest for investigative reporting. When you look at those IRE winners, well, tell me about this. Are these IRE winners not as powerful as they should For be? years, that was a measure. How many, how many entries are you getting, and what's the quality of the entries? And, you know, that's been consistent, but investigative reporting has never, ever, since the invention of journalism, been the be-all and end-all of journalism. It's always a very small cohort of people, and these people continue to operate. Investigative reporting is in pretty good shape, but it's in nonprofits. It's yes. in reporters who work for nothing because they're driven to do it. And you see it even in papers that are struggling, however you want to characterize the Times Union, for example. The piece they did recently about the bolts on the Tappan Zee Bridge was as fine a piece of local investigative reporting as I've seen in 20 years. So it isn't just completely disappearing, but you are far, far less likely to see it now than you were in the 90s. So when was the golden age of newspapers? Would you say it was the uh, 90s? Uh, those days. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think it was the Hearst era in the late 1800s when there was no competition, when there was tons of money for metros. They all competed with each other. They put out new forms of journalism, photojournalism and features and comics. That all came from that era. We still use those same formats. So well, that's, well, that's it. interesting, but that wasn't the golden age of great reporting because Probably that was not. driven by establishment powers and there wasn't really investigative work then. It was But Rex had brought out because of the resources that were available. That's when you got your Nellie Bly that's when you got your muckrakers. Mm -hmm. You have to have money to do great reporting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. One of the points that Rosemary just made about the power of not-for-profit journalism rising these days. You know, full disclosure, I'm on the board of the Adirondack Explorer, this wonderful magazine that is a not-for-profit based in the Adirondacks, which is doing investigative reporting about, especially like these great stories about road salt, about water, about natural resources. And that is funded by donors and foundations and subscriptions. Actually, they're gaining uh, subscriptions. But that is kind of an interesting model. The not-for-profit newsrooms around the country are really picking up some of the slack that the for-profits mm. are falling down on. Well, that certainly is true at public radio. I don't understand what's going on at every public radio station. But at this one, we are having fund drives like we never thought were possible. It's I mean, the money value. that's coming in is extraordinary. We're talking about $100,000 a day when we used to wait for two weeks uh, to have 100000 <laughs> dollars, same amount of money that we're doing in a day now. And that's mm -hmm. because people, as you say, Rosemary, are valuing what they're getting. Yeah. Hey, what's going on, by the way, down at WNYC, which is the largest public radio station in the country? Uh, ben Smith, the uh, media columnist of the New York Times, wrote about the turmoil there, the program that they air called On the Media, which I think you air here in, uh, we do. in WAMC. It's um, not as good as this program, but, <laughs> but we do air it. But it seems that there is tumult arising from a lot of human resources issues. Do we believe this is true? What do you think is happening there? Is that question directed to me or to it, could be, yes, sir. It would be, it would be just fine. Here's Sexism or bullying? What do I know about that? <laughs> well, the truth of the matter is that WNYC has always been the number one public radio station in America when it comes to being judged by the amount of resources that are spent. The CEO there was paid a great deal of money, something that would be impossible around here. And yet, one wonders what's behind the Ben Smith piece. I mean, it was a kill piece, let's face it, and really reflected very badly on WNYC. Well, maybe it was accurate, and there are just some yeah, tough no, things. No, no, that's true. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. That's true. I've never been a big fan, to be honest with you, but maybe it was accurate. But then, when you see the New York Times saying that, I don't know whether it was tongue-in-cheek or not, but maybe somebody else here caught it saying that, WNYC in New York City wanted to be the voice of record. Yes, uh, that's a new statement. The new editor-in-chief, Audrey Cooper, who, again, disclosure, is a friend of mine. Everybody's said, a friend of you. She, <laughs> she used to be the editor-in-chief of the San Francisco Chronicle. Right. And was brought in, and one of the controversies is they wanted a person with experience in radio, that is the employees wanted, sorry, experience in radio, Some of them somebody who knew New York City and somebody who was a person of color, and Audrey is none of those. So, so people got mad. People got mad, yeah. 
Well, it was their fault, too, because they said to the employees, who are you looking for in a new leader? If you ask somebody's opinion, you got to at least pay some lip service to sure. it. Sure. So I felt sorry for Arthur Cooper reading about this controversy in the past week because it sounds like she was hired to work on digitization and organization, and she's very good in all of those, and none of it counts for anything. She fired somebody who was accused of plagiarism, which, you know, on the face of it, that's pretty admirable, and she took all kinds of fire for that. To be a person unwanted, in a big, rich newsroom is a really difficult situation to be in. Are we sure, by the way, that the New York Times, which we were just talking about, is off the hook? In other words, all I am is a pilgrim, a questioner. Um, <laughs> are, 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 are we sure? A wandering sure? minstrel. Uh, yeah, yes. exactly right. Are we sure that the New York Times didn't have its own oar in all of this? After all, I just quoted them as saying, the New York Times saying they wanted to be the voice of record. Well, we all know who the voice of record is in New York City. It's the New York Times. And uh, one at least uh, thinks of this as a possibility. Rex, the phone is ringing and they you want you to be. Have the a, yeah, that's a real. I don't know. I don't get that, especially because it's written by Basically. their media columnist yeah. who is extremely independent. Yeah. He's written on a number of topics that's made the Times uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you might be right. It's hard to rule that out entirely, but I don't see a lot of evidence of well, it. Well, that's right. I only, I'm only yeah. raising it as a possibility. As a possibility. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but as someone who's been in management, you got to keep in mind the fact that you never really know all the details of what's happening in a situation like that's that. True. That There are a lot of things that people in position positions of authority are not going to say because they're trying to protect the company or they're trying to protect sure. the employees. So. But they did say a lot, Judy. <laughs> well put. <laughs> Absolutely so. If you're just joining us, by the way, this is the Media Project from Northeast Public Radio. Alan Shartok, Rosemary Armeo, Judy Patrick, and I'm Rex Smith, and we are grateful to have you with us. If you want to share your views, media at wamc.org is how you do that. Media at wamc.org, and we will hopefully use some of your thoughts. Speaking of things that we don't know about human resources uh, in in organizations, the Associated Press is drawing fire, to use the phrase you just did, for firing a 22-year-old journalist who had just been with the organization for a couple of weeks because of pro-Palestinian tweets that she had uh, posted when she was a college student. The leaders of the AP are now saying, well, we made some mistakes. We shouldn't have done it the way we did, but it was the right solution. Raising the question, what sort of freedom should journalists have on social media? So, Judy, take me to your newsroom since you've had this experience. When you have reporters who work for you, do you expect them to not post on social media their own views? Uh, they're damned if they do, and they're damned if they don't. <laughs> there, there it uh, is. Social media is a minefield for journalists nowadays, and I'm working with the local newspapers that I deal with about developing social media policies to give them some sense. I read AP's social media policy, and it's really not very clear. You're not supposed to, you know, affect, uh, you know, you're not supposed to express strong opinions. But to be honest, to be if you're going to get any traction on social media, you have to have a little bit of an, an edge, and then with an edge comes an opinion. So. Yeah. More seasoned journalists tend to be more careful in their tweets, and they tend to be more boring. If you want to mm. attract followers and, and do something on social media, you've got to have an edge. <laughs> Not that I have any experience in this <laughs> at all, <laughs> <laughs> expressing opinion and being punished for it. I, I believe that this young woman, who is Jewish, by the way, saying yeah. free Palestine, had she been saying, you know, Israel is in the right, she would not be in this trouble. And part of the problem is that not just that she violated the policy, I think that's a cover-up for later, is that she expressed an opinion that got uh, lots of attention to the AP in the negative sense. Well, Israeli supporters were coming back and saying, this is outrageous, we can't have her, and they did not defend her. Whether she did it when she was in college, or I really suspect she has written something more recently that we just don't know about because they're not telling us, but during the latest uprising with Hamas and the Israelis, if she wrote something then, they did not protect her. They threw her under the bus to say, oh, yeah, yeah, we're fair and balanced. That's what makes it so outrageous. So, Rex, Judy, Rosemary, what would you have done with a contemporary? You go last, Rosemary, because I think we suspect what you're going to say. <laughs> but, Rex, would you have fired somebody for that? No. For one thing, this is all purely hypothetical. Again, as Judy pointed out, we don't know all the details. Mm -hmm. We don't know what kinds of things go on. But a new employee who's been there for two weeks, I never fired anybody on a first offense, I don't think. You really give people warnings. You talk about what they've done, especially a young person, especially for something before that. Actually, this point is made by one of the observers. When you give in to the online mob 
And that's what there is. I mean, basically, the mob came after this young reporter and the AP caved. And when you give in to that, you're going to get hit from the other side. It may not have been a mob. It may have been one letter. Who knows, you know, what they succumb to. Judy, what were you, how are you going to answer No, that? I would not have, have fired. I mean, I, again, I don't know all the details. And then they're not telling us what tweet or what series of tweet or what social media post led to this at all. But it's true. The right wing does come after AP quite a bit. When I was in an editor's chair and, and used AP, I got regular calls from right wing people against AP. And this isn't the first time AP's been attacked, and it won't be the last. And this just encourages it. Rosemary? Yeah, I would not have fired her. I have fired people for one offense, a first offense. But not this one. The AP wants its people known. They want a voice out there because that brings them authority and recognition. But yet, when she does do that, she's punished for it anyway. Damned if you do, damned if you and don't. If, you have a right. Truly, sorry, are they going to rehire her? I'm not hearing anything about that. And do you guys have a series of policies that you lay out in a handbook, for example, that says what's appropriate and what's not? That's the other question we do here at WMC. Yeah, yeah, I was not as good on handbook policies as I should have been during my uh, years as editor. And I think that lack of clarity is problematic for people. I think you do need to have, especially in this social media powerful era, you need to help people understand what is right and what is not. But it is an awfully awkward situation. You know, and here's another thing that this speaks to, and that is the news organization standing behind their staff. As editors, you know, I think an editor has a, or anybody who runs a news newsroom has three responsibilities to the staff that you lead, to the enterprise you serve, and to the community that you're serving. You're not supposed to waste money. You're supposed to support the enterprise. You're supposed to do your journalism for the good of the community, but you also have responsibility to your staff. But when you don't stand behind your staff, when they make a mistake, say, it isn't that you say to the community, well, this story was right. I don't care if it was wrong. That's not standing behind your staff, but it is saying, we will have your back. When you make a mistake, we will explain the mistake. We will talk about it. We're not going to just sacrifice our staff. You know, taking a moment to pat myself on the back, I invented this program because I wanted a vehicle where the established press and the public radio press could talk to each other. And things have changed dramatically. Our morning guy, who is terrific, David Speedy Gustina, the guy who is the producer of this program, has virtually every major editor in our region on. In the old days, that would have been approached with a different kind of caution. The owners of the papers and stuff would say, well, why should we give them credibility by being on? Now, everybody flocks to be on David's show. So I think that power relationships are changing. That's all I'm saying. We all need each other, for one thing. We do. You know, but it took you guys a long time to figure that out. Well, I, yeah. <laughs> but I should note, when I, when I used to cover the media, Alan Chartok always returned my calls very quickly. You were powerful. Uh, that's because he's a news hound. <laughs> no, no, it, 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 it was complicated. There were a lot of reasons. But not, <laughs> not the one, but the one reason that, you know, one would call Judy or any other editor back is because you basically were yelling, please don't kill me. <laughs> Right. You know, I used to do workshops for business people through the Chamber of Commerce on crisis communication uh, with a PR firm. Uh, I would play the role of the editor and who knew what would come out. But you've got to stand up right away. If, if the media has a story and you don't speak to them, that's hard for you to avoid the story appearing without uh, anything. Voice, of you. But you know yeah, what? This could be a whole other program which we should do about the risks of response and yeah. how you respond because there are dangers either way. Yeah. All right, Ellen, I was just calling you about the fun drive results. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just tell us how much you made. Speaking of the perils, the real peril that confronts journalists around the world, the brave wow. journalists, in this case, Roman Protasevich, who was abducted from a commercial airliner in European airspace. The strongman of Belarus intercepted a flight just before it left the country's airspace, forced it down by a jet, and arrested this young journalist activist, Roman Protasevich. What a terrifying situation this is. And this shows us the peril that journalists internationally face. Rosemary, you work with a lot of journalists around the world. I find this an appalling situation akin to the invasion of Crimea by Russia, which was an open attack by 
by one country against another. And what happened then? Nothing. Who holds Crimea now? Russia. Who's behind what happened above the skies of Minsk? I believe it was the same man, Putin, who has learned his lessons that the Western powers are all talk and no action. This was a completely outrageous thing to do. Lukashenko has put out a number of statements since this happened earlier this week saying, I had to do it. It was it was for the safety of the people involved because we got a message from Hamas that they had put a bomb on the plane. We had to protect yeah, them. Yeah. And the fact that it flew back to Minsk rather than to Vilnius, which is in Lithuania, yeah. a different country which was closer, that's overlooked. And then he, it's just a coincidence that this young man happened to be on. He's an activist as well as a journalist. That's part of the problem. And three other people, well, it was his girlfriend and two other people. Those two other people have now said, no, we just, we got off at Minsk and we're not going any further because we just decided to end our journey. Baloney. And we They're didn't KGB want to be agents. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. KGB is the yep. secret police, and they actually do call them that in Belarus. And he is now convincing people. I have a friend who works for state-run media there, so she's very biased. Mm -hmm. and she's like, you know, there are countries that don't like Belarus, and this is an attack on us, and this was all planned, and we need an international investigation. No, we don't. We need sanctions and action, and I don't think it'll happen. The EU is going to not let Belarus planes fly over their space and won't go into Minsk, which makes a lot of sense. But it was an act of piracy. It was an act of international terrorism. And what are we going to do about it? This is way more than, I'm sorry, just journalists. Well, now, you raised an interesting point, though. That is the notion that Roman Protasevich was activist and journalist. Right. Isn't this the peril that we face even in the United States sure. uh, as we, if we have another Trump in Washington? Or well, even, if, yep, even absolutely. with this Trump. Mm -hmm. the, the one we just got rid of and that we may have again, the idea, of course, is that he would say that the New York Times guys and the Washington Post guys are activist journalists. That's what he would say, and I'm sure it's what he is saying. It, it's a really difficult problem, and in the United States, we've tried to avoid it by being objective. But in Eastern Europe, they're all activists. The Russian journalists who are killed are actually fighting against the government. And Azerbaijan— But, but they're fighting for truth. That's the thing. You they're know? like Abraham Lincoln. They're, yeah. they're not just you know great journalists. They're yeah. great patriots. But that does change the dynamic of the government going after them. It's not for their free speech. It's for their inspiration because they are rousing other people to act against the government. <laughs> sure, we Wouldn't all know you? what's going on. Hmm? This dictator wants to control his he wants his to press. stop dissent. Yeah. Yeah. But if you are that dictator, if you're trying to hold on to office when you have lost an election. Sure. And the press is pointing that out. Sound it, familiar? It, it, that yeah. Sound familiar. Yeah. So this is a peril, folks, that we might find too close to home. We're out of time. Imagine that. What a great show. Here we are in person. Makes a difference, doesn't it? <laughs> it's a great thing. Alan Shartok, Rosemary Romeo, Judy Patrick, I'm Rex Smith, and David Gustina, our producer, is sitting right here. Imagine that. We're grateful Speedy. to him and to you folks for joining us this week on The Media Project. <laughs>